Hello, Year 12 again. Um, we're going to be looking today again at the question of succession, but this time we will focus on two potential successors. Agrippa, who we know from the earlier part of the course, we should know from the Battle of uh, Nolicus, the Battle of Philippi, and the Battle of Actium. Absolutely key member of the imperial family, not by biology and genetics, but by adoption. You will recall that Agrippa becomes Augustus' son-in-law, uh, uh, adopted son, I should say. And then we'll also be looking at Tiberius, Tiberius, who is a very interesting character and who is going to become the emperor, but who is someone that Augustus never really wanted as the emperor. So the great irony will be that Augustus ends up with a successor who, according to Suetonius, he despises. Okay, so first of all, I wanted to start with these coins over here. What do they show? They show two men together. Of course, this is Agrippa and Octavian, and this is celebrating the Battle of Actium. You will all recall that the crocodile is a symbol of Egypt and Cleopatra and the Hellenic idea, the idea of the monstrous, etc. Now, why I have started with this is to show the closeness of the relationship between them, as we're going to see in a minute. Uh, Agrippa becomes a kind of co princeps and a designated successor. We spoke last time, didn't we, about the fact that when Augustus became very ill in 23 BCE, uh, he gives the signet ring not to Marcellus, who appeared to be his chosen successor, but instead to Agrippa. Why this is, we don't know. My own belief would be that it would be to please the Senate. If you were a senator and you're looking at a guy who's in his 20s, like Marcellus, who is completely untried and doesn't have a record of governorship or military conquest, etc., then Agrippa seems a really safe pair of hands by comparison. Now, we know, don't we, that one of the reasons why Agrippa is so successful, and this is in addition to being a great general, is because he had a very modest image. You'll recall that he turns down triumphs, doesn't he? So it seems to me that one of his great characteristics is to be happy to be in the shade of Caesar Augusta, uh, Diva Filius, Princeps, Imperator, etc., etc. Yeah? Uh, we know that he was absolutely key. Uh, Munro did a very good presentation on the Battle of Nolicus, you'll remember, the defeat of Sextus, but even there, he goes into the shade, does he not, yeah? Uh, Augustus really valued Agrippa, to the point that he gives his only daughter, Julia, in marriage. That's someone who Jana likes very much and admires. And um, Agrippa was flooded with money, as we know, and he was, as well as being a great general, he was an amazing builder, an amazing administrator, a builder of things like aqueducts, and also the Pantheon, you will remember. So he is an absolutely central person in terms of the succession. Now, in terms of the second settlement, you will recall that this is in the 23 BCE. It follows the first settlement of 27 BCE. And incidentally, for your end of year exam, you need to know those settlements inside out. Agrippa's constitutional powers were greatly increased by Augustus. Now, why would this be? Well, we know that Augustus was sick in 23 BCE. We know that the mausoleum shows that even as far back as 28 BC, he's thinking really carefully about succession and family and dynasty, etc. So August, uh, uh, Agrippa's role is really important for you to know about, okay? It provided that the principate of Augustus, it, with greater constitutional um, stability, and it also made sure that there was a designated heir. So as you will recall, he gave Agrippa the signet ring. This is a very clear symbol to the Senate that the Republic is not going to return and that the successor will be chosen by Augustus and that effectively the Republic of, you know, Yule is gone. We know that uh, Augustus never says the Republic is dead. He says the Republic is restored, but he makes it quite clear that the Republic that is completely dominated by the Senate is over. No two ways about it. And in the course of this year, 23 BC, 
He gets proconsular uh, imperium similar to Augustus's power. Now, this is very interesting. Later, he will get the tribunician power. Do you remember that that becomes the most important power for the designated imperial successor? But in 23 BC, he gets proconsular imperium, which is also extremely important in terms of securing power. Now, were these powers equal to Augustus? Well, one of the things that we know from Res Gestae is that Augustus does not rely on potestas, he relies on auctoritas, thank you class, auctoritas. So would Agrippa's auctoritas have been equal to Augustus's? M most certainly not. The concentration of power, religious power, military power, legislative power, was still incredibly focused in Augustus. So it would be an overstatement, in my opinion, to call him a kind of co princip at this stage, yeah? But in 18 BC, he does grant him tribunitiana potestas. So that's the key thing. That's when you are not made a tribune, but you are given the powers of a tribune. So we know Augustus's technique of not taking an office, but assuming the powers of the office, are now being passed on to, August, uh, on to Agrippa. So we see how he's securing a successor here, and it would appear that Agrippa was quite popular. He had a great reputation. He certainly had his own autoritas. He wasn't considered a very likable man. Suetonius tells us that he was very quick to anger, doesn't he? He says that Mycenaeus talked too much, and Agrippa was too aggressive and too easy to anger. However, he had a superb reputation, not least of which because Philippi, uh, uh, the Perusine Wall, Perugia, Nolicus, Actium, and the list goes on. Fabulous general, fabulous imperator. And he has veto power, this is very important, class, veto power over the acts of the Senate or other magistrates. Of course, that's part of the tribunician power isn't it? So it shows that this tribunician power is absolutely central. So here is definitely our designated successor. Unfortunately, as ever, people have a tendency to die in Rome, don't they? And even though Agrippa was hale and fit and strong and the military macho man and spindly legged uh, Augustus, as we know, who tended to faint in battles, was supposed to die much earlier, Augustus outlives Agrippa, doesn't he? So why is he such an important uh, kind of character as a successor? Well, there's personal friendship that goes back to boyhood, isn't there? Plus, they shared those adventures in the Iberian Peninsula. Do you remember when they went to meet Julius Caesar? He is a military genius, is he not? Even to the extent, do you remember, of building fake lakes so that he could test his ships, etc. He smashes... Uh, Pompey, uh, uh, Sextus Pompey, doesn't he? We know that he smashes Mark Antony at the Battle of Actium once again. He's brilliant on land and at sea. He becomes the son. He marries Julia. That's very important. Uh, he has this incredible autoritas as well, second only to um, Augustus, and he's a wonderful builder and planner. He also occupies an incredibly important role in the East. Now, you may remember that Suetonius contends that Agrippa is jealous of Marcellus and takes himself off to the east in a self-imposed exile. That is easily dismissed. And this is a very good example of how to evaluate the source. It's easy to dismiss because if you had an angry rival, would you send him to the part of the world that had 75% of your legions? Of course not. It shows, doesn't it, the complete trust that Augustus had in Agrippa. And in terms of the frontier policy, it's very important for you to know that Agrippa really secures their eastern frontier more so than ever. And that's very important because one of the things when we look at uh, Augustus and we judge him overall will be this Pax Romana, this, or this or, uh, Pax Augusta, this peace that's gonna last for over 200 years and is looked back on as the high point of the Roman Empire. And of course, finally, on a personal level, he was discreet, 
and happy to be overshadowed. He turned down the triumph, etc. So if ever you wanted a successor, this guy is the best vice president, don't you think? Highly competent, but not massively ambitious, extremely loyal, and happy to be overshadowed. Now there's going to be a more difficult chap that we're going to look at now. Tiberius here, fabulous abs, don't you think? Great body, does that mean he looked like that? Unlikely, isn't it? But by this stage now, we've talked, haven't we, about the classical Hellenic tradition of idolized human form as well and truly embedded in Rome, isn't it? Just to remind you, Tiberius is over here. He is not Augustus's son. He is the son of Livia. And his brother is Drusus. Now, in terms of the succession, don't forget, he likes two princelings two successors, and then various theories for that. Obviously having two mirrors the consulship as we said before, but it's also hedging your bets in a city in which mortality was incredibly high. I've called him the unloved stepson, although there's some controversy over this. Suetonius certainly wants us to believe that Tiberius was not loved by Augustus. But some of you who've read your Suetonius will see that he actually often quotes letters between Augustus and Tiberius that seem to be quite affectionate. So once again, if we're looking to evaluate Suetonius, that might be a moment when you sort of say, hey, he's a wee bit inconsistent here. And some of what he says later seems to be hearsay to me. And now I'm going to pause my screen recording, and I'm going to set you five questions, and I'm going to give you a mere five minutes to do them, so you have to be fast. Go. Okay, we'll resume, okay? And as this is a screencast, I'll talk through the answers. I think that's probably the best way. Um, how did Augustus advance Tiberius's political career at the age of 17 in 24 BCE? Well, it was the normal uh, route, wasn't it? What do we call it? A kind of accelerated promotion, wasn't it? Yeah? So in other words, and this is where it's very interesting, the restorer of the Republic is completely willing to waive Roman traditions when it suits him. And when it suits him most is when he is designating his successors. You know the cursus honorum, this kind of system that had been in operation for hundreds of years? He circumnavigates that, doesn't he? And that, of course, goes back to his own experience, do you remember? where he was given religious and political office before his time. And let's not forget in Res Gestae, he, he begins it by talking about leading an army at 19. So he himself did not respect these Mos Memorum, these Roman traditions, etc. And we know that he's already done this with Marcellus. And now Tiberius is given this kind of accelerated promotion. Now, Suetonius often tells us that was due to his wife, Livia. He says that Livia is constantly trying to advance Tiberius's career, etc. Suetonius is an absolute shocking misogynist. He seems to particularly dislike uh, Livia and Agrippina, um, who will find out about it in Tiberius's reign more. And he always sees them as kind of plotting and ambitious, etc. Um, some of you may know that he even suggests that maybe Livia poisoned Augustus at the end of their lives, even though they seem to have been an extremely happy, harmonious couple. So how did Agrippa's death affect Tiberius's status? Well, clearly it affected it a great deal, because uh, Augustus at the time had a number of choices. We know that according to um, Suetonius, and this would be supported by the coinage and by other sources, that Augustus loved Gaius and Lucius, uh, the princeps juventutis, the young princeps, he calls them, yeah? And the Arapacus too, very good, yeah. And so I'll remind you that if you can sort of intertextually connect between the literature, the politics, the visual stuff, that's really good. 
But Gaius and Lucius were too young, weren't they? So he did need an established um, commander with autoritas, an imperator. Tiberius was a fabulous general and was incredibly successful in virtually all of his battles. So when Agrippa died, Tiberius kind of slips into his place, does he not? The problem, of course, is that he has to also slip into the same marriage bed, doesn't he, class? Do you remember that? He's forced to divorce Vipsania, who he absolutely loved by all accounts, and would be visibly broken when he saw her after the divorce. And he uh, married Julia. And later he claims that Julia had a terrible reputation. He knew that she was a woman of no moral standing, etc. So was this one of the reasons why he was really angry? We're not quite sure, but it's certainly something that creates a lot of tension between Tiberius and Augustus. I think even outside the pages of Suetonius, that seems to be accepted by quite a few historians. Um, now, moving on to number four here, why did Tiberius's oh, no apostrophe there, retirement to Rhodes put Augustus in a difficult position? And how did the princeps show his displeasure? Well, I really want to talk about this one for at least three minutes because it's so important. So in 6 BCE, Augustus gives Tiberius the tribunician potestas. We all remember why that's so important, don't we? Yeah? That is the key office, isn't it, of the, uh, of the new kind of emperor. It's a beautiful office because it's not as visible as the consulship, is it? But it has enormous powers. Powers of veto, powers to speak first, powers to strike down legislation, etc. So Tiberius is given this honor and clearly then designated as successor. What happens? Well, he decides that he's going to take himself off to Rhodes. Now, there's a hell of a lot of speculation about this, and much of it is idle. But clearly there's something that's happened, and it must have been enormously embarrassing to Augustus, don't you think? To have the second most powerful man in this gigantic enlarged Rome going off to Rhodes and rejecting his office. And if you read your booklet, uh, it sounds like Augustus even went into the Senate and complained to the senators and said, this man is not doing his duty. And uh, according to some uh, alleged Yana, uh, accounts or apocryphal accounts, uh, Augustus publicly pleaded with Tiberius. So that possibly could be true. The point being is that there's a consensus that this was enormously embarrassing and disruptive to the plans of succession. And it shows another of the problems of the succession plans and why at the end of the course I'm going to argue the succession really is Augustus's greatest failure. So we know then that Tiberius, after he's cooled down, etc., and he's in the island of Rhodes, asked to come back, does he not? His self-imposed exile, however, becomes a genuine exile, doesn't it? Because now Augustus is angry and won't have him back. And of course, two young boys are growing up. Who are they? Gaius and Lucius are growing up. So he feels that he's, got to, he's going to have another option. We know from Res Gesto that he loves Gaius and Lucius. He actually mentions them even though they die at a relatively young age. And if we're to go on Suetonius, it would seem as though Augustus vastly preferred the two boys. Was that because they were his blood? Was that temperament? Was that because he could mould them more? We don't know. But it would appear as though Gaius and Lucius would have been the preferred uh, successors to him. Okay. So then, of course, why was Tiberius eventually de declared the co princeps And the answer is death. 
and lack of options. So if we go through it now, we will see right from the beginning with Marcellus and then Agrippa, then Gaius and Lucius, etc. And of course, Tiberius' brother Drusus is also killed. Remember how I said they like to go in pairs? So Augustus would have been very happy having Tiberius and Drusus working in a pair, but Drusus is dead. Now the two boys are both dead. This is a real shock to Augustus, and it hurts him very, very much indeed. Now, later I'll show you that Suetonius claims that Augustus is aware that Tiberius will make a bad emperor. Now, we can see from these statues here, this is Augustus, and then we have Gaius over here, and Lucius here, and these statues did actually appear together, that the princeps juventutis were incredibly important. And I want to pause on this, and I want to say to you this. Is this not monarchical? That at such a young age, without any achievements, any proven record, that they were given this title. And it sounds like they've clearly been designated as successors. Now that to me sounds incredibly based on primogeniture and on you know, blood relationships that you would associate with monarchy. You will recall these famous coins, yeah? The, uh, the aureus showing Gaius and Lucius. Of course, we have Augustus. He never ages, just like Queen Elizabeth. He's forever incredibly handsome, isn't he? What's he wearing on his head, guys? Exactly, the civic crown, that very important emblem, isn't it? Which is both monarchical but also republican, isn't it, in every way? And on the other side are... Gaius and Lucius. Can you see them there? So it does appear, if we go on the coinage, that they're very much being designated here as his successors. So is this one of the reasons why Tiberius was always angry and resentful and felt in the shadow of others? Now, Resgesti, on terms of Tiberius, says, Greater Armenia... I might have made a province after its king Artaxes had been killed, but I preferred following the models set by our ancestors. There's a phrase that our man Augustus loves, isn't he? He's just following the customs of the ancestors to hand over the kingdom of Tigranes to the son of Artavastes and the grandson of King Tigranes, Tiberius Nero, who was then my stepson, carried this out. Now, I don't know how much you can read into this, yeah, but it's just interesting that he does make it clear he was then my stepson. Later, he is going to adopt him. But a lot of historians say, is that a little signal, you know, that it was almost like a reluctant adoption? Do you know what I mean? It seems really interesting that he describes him in those ways. Suetonius, chapter 101. He appointed as his chief heirs Tiberius to receive two-thirds of his estate, this is his will, and Livia, one-third. These he also bade assume his name. So, of course, you know, after the death of Augustus, Tiberius will take on the name of Augustus II. It will become the imperial name, won't it? along with the signet ring, and so much more. So the whole structure and apparatus that Augustus sets up will become the model of how to be an emperor until the dominate takes over from the Principate. yeah? His heirs in the second degree were Drusus, son of Tiberius. It's, Drusus is confusing, guys, because there's Drusus, brother to Tiberius, and then there's Drusus, son of Tiberius, for one third, and for rest, Germanicus and his three male children. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that Germanicus, uh, Augustus, makes sure that Tiberius adopts him. Germanicus is an incredibly famous, wildly popular general. But what do you think happens to him? dies again. Okay, so we have this kind of real sense in which the best contenders 
for you know the office seem to die and Tiberius gets it through a process of simply surviving. Now this is a wonderful quote. It doesn't come from a prescribed source but it comes from the life of Tiberius and according to Suetonius, although he does not cite his source, Augustus said, watching Tiberius eating, poor Rome, doomed to be masticated by those slow-moving jaws. So I imagine Tiberius eating, do you think he had his mouth open slightly with the food falling out? Who knows? But anyway, chewing away there, having a little bit of a munch. Do we take it seriously? I think we have to, don't you? Because we know that Suetonius had access to all kinds of documents, etc. He worked for Hadrian. He was uh, someone who went into libraries. He clearly is quoting from some things. But this may be an apocryphal story, don't you think? It has an apocryphal feel to it. I want to remind you, Jana, evaluating the sources, questioning them, asking whether they really cited or whether they feel like they're a little bit gossipy, a little bit apocryphal. This to me feels a wee bit apocryphal, but it has validity because it does seem as though Tiberius and Augustus weren't as close as you might have liked them to be. And just to remind you about the Julio-Claudian dynasty, which is going to last uh, for four emperors after this, Tiberius, Caligula, who was the son of Germanicus, so Tiberius' son doesn't become the emperor, uh, uh, Caligula is going to, then Claudius, who is my favorite emperor, he had a club foot, a stammer, and he seemed to have Tourette syndrome, and then Nero, who was the emperor who fiddled while Rome burned, and who rejoiced in burning Christians. So when we are looking at Augustus and we're summing up the succession, what are we thinking, class, with this little lineage here? One of the things I want you to think about is Tacitus is writing here, have a look, think about the screen, after Nero. So why Nero, not Nero, you can tell I'm teaching Indian history on the side. Um, so he's looking back at these disastrous emperors. That helps to explain the caustic tone, the anger, the regret for the Republic, doesn't it? Even if he feels that Augustus was a fairly successful emperor. My final slide. So what does all of this tell us about the succession? Augustus basically gets his last choice in Tiberius if we're to believe Suetonius. However, the dynastic principle is established, but arguably that is a principle that seems to have been established in 28 BC. Class, what's our evidence for saying that? the mausoleum, the architecture of the mausoleum is very telling. So we have all of these attempts in the first, second and third constitutional settlement in which a lot of the power is cloaked and camouflaged, but the mausoleum very clearly seems to symbolize the coming of a kind of more monarchical authoritarian idea in which the Roman Republic will have a kind of emperor-like figure that sits on top of the existing structure. So was this a betrayal of meritocracy? Well, we could argue that even uh, the Republic itself wasn't particularly meritocratic, that a lot of that worked through patronage, etc. But it definitely suggests that bloodline is going to become very important. And we see that with Gaius and Lucius, don't we? Was there ever meritocracy? I'm going to say I don't think so, but you could argue um, that it was better than uh, it was better before. And the Republic, I think we have to say, was finished. No doubt about that. I've made some terrible errors here. Um, Tacitus seems to have a very powerful point when he talks about Augustus getting the powers of the magistrates, the powers of the senators, and the powers of, even of the priests, as we see, monopolizing religious office as well as military office as well. 
and that helps to explain uh, Tacitus' point of view. And I'm going to end by just saying it's very important that you know your Tacitus, because even though it's short, we can use it in a lot of essays, particularly when we want to take Augustus's achievements apart and have a counter-argument to show, in particular, that the succession was not a successful one. Thank you for listening.